Listeners, beware. You're in for a scare. Howdy, folks. Welcome to Nightmare on Fear Street, an R.L. Stein podcast. I'm Meg. I'm Zach. And today we are talking about a spooky, scary piece of uh, steamy young adult fiction called Halloween Night. And Zach, is this a Fear Street book or is this not a Fear Street book? So I've gotten emails and apparently this isn't a Fear Street book and it makes sense now that there's a gigantic sticker that says not Fear Street on it. It's actually, I guess, a thriller book. Ironically, it's Halloween Night, so you can say as you will of Michael Jackson being in this book. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this isn't a Fear Street book, but it's still written in the, in the Fear Street style. So it has all of R. L. Stein's distinctive, uh, like literary author traits, uh, such as sudden stops. The, so, oh yeah, random full stops in the middle of sentences. No one with leggings, but like really weird, like hip dated references. We yeah, many 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 nineties references. Um adventurous fashion choices i would say i think at one point uh one of the characters wears black skinny jeans with a green baggy jumper and a leopard print jacket over it no i think it was like a leopard print like tracksuit almost i think that's what she was talking about <laughs> yeah or like a like a leopard print tracksuit jacket which is like just makes me think of um uh, you know the movie matilda oh yes the mom from matilda mrs wormwood always wore shit like that in the in, in matilda and it, even in the even in the stage show, they dress up like that a little bit. Yeah, no, we still dress yeah. like that. The funny thing is, oh. what I think about when I when I read all this stuff is either like late eighties or just anyone in like Seattle at this moment in time. Oh yeah, exactly. Like this could be. It's like that um, mystery science theater joke from their uh, zombie nightmare episode, where I think it was Mike goes. This is either America 10 years ago or Canada right now. <laughs> and I think the same could be said for, like, Seattle or Melbourne. No, Seattle is just perpetually in the 90s, so... And whereas Melbourne exists in its own pocket dimension. Yeah, its own pocket dimension of time and space. I live in, Like, California is kind of like, yeah, we're trendy. Everyone says, yas, and where's oh. Daisy Dukes? Meg, how was your space? Spooky week. My spooky week was, uh... It was my friend's birthday on Saturday. My friend Claire, who gets name dropped all the time on Trivial Terror, has not been on the show yet. God willing, I will get her on one day, but um, if she wants to, she might not. But, yeah, it was her birthday, and they were showing Viva Las Vegas at the Randwick Ritz, and we all went to see that, and then we went and got some tapas, and we had drinks at a really cool bar called Bat Country in Randwick. So, shout out to Bat Country in Randwick. <laughs> That's good. That's actually a really good movie, and I really like Elvis Presley, so it's yeah, fine. Yeah, I love Elvis. It's Yeah, it's either Elvis or Johnny Cash, but, you know, I kind of like Elvis more. Elvis is sort of the, like, Johnny Cash is, like, the slightly, like, edgier. Emo Elvis? Yeah, he's a bit emo Elvis. I mean, he covered a Nine Inch Nails song, and the cover became more famous than the original song. Yeah, it's like in every edgy <laughs> movie ever now. Yeah, and of course... Then he also did, like, what, I Fought the Law and the Law One, uh, the one where he's like, I fell into a burning ring of fire. Yeah, he really, he he's the, uh, the... He's like the Kurt Gobain of the 50s. I, I don't know, I don't really associate him with the 50s, he's sort of timeless, whereas Elvis was like, peak Elvis was the 50s and 60s. No, I think I, my favorite Elvis is the 70s. I'm sorry. So, um... <laughs> like, hunk a hunk of burning love. Oh, was that the 70s? Yeah, that was, that was like Vegas, baby. Oh. Like Fat Elvis. Yeah, if if Elvis and um, Johnny Cash were stores in a mall, El, uh, Johnny Cash would be your Hot Topic and uh, Elvis would be your Hollister. <laughs> no, more like H&M. No, yeah, he's classier than Hollister. He'd be your H&M. He's got more universal appeal. We don't have Hollister here. We got H&M. And then, I don't know, uh, Forever 21 is like ABBA or something. So, Zach, how was your spooky week? It was really spooky we had our solar eclipse today and i didn't look exactly at the sun but i looked at it through my phone congratulations so, you are smarter than the president of the united states 
Um, and then tomorrow we get an at uh, on the at F- wrong. Fear Street trip. You're yeah, wrong. Nightmare on Fear Street is a garbage show for babies. These foreign podcasters coming in saying bad things about me looking at the sun. Well, guess what? I'm rich enough to buy five new eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, speaking of train wrecks, I've been playing Dream Daddy. So I've just been playing my gay dad simulator. <laughs> oh, I, I, I deleted my Steam account because uh, Steam was using up too much memory on my computer and I had to get rid of it so I could like download the programs I needed for uni. Um, and also, I'm not that big into games, but like, I, I know enough about Dream Daddy and I know that there is a cryptid dad. I love this game. Like, I didn't think that I would get into, like, a gay dad simulator, but I've gotten into it really, really hard. It's, it's like it's like me being a dad in training. I'm like, I'm ready. Well, I've been playing, um, I've almost finished The Wolf Among Us. I actually just remembered that I've got, like, a little bit of Chapter 5 left. Cannot wait for the second season, and, um, yeah, The Wolf Among Us is great. My favorite character, that's still Bloody Mary, so, oh my god. Oh, Bloody Mary's rad. Like, she's the person I want to strive to be, like, if I was ever a villain. I mean, honestly, like, but her look, like, real short, sort of posh spice hair with a red streak in it, like, weird arcane tattoos all up and down her arms, big, bloody axe. Is that your aesthetic, Meg? That is goals. That is hashtag goals. I will walk into a job interview looking like that. (laughs) permanent witch face and like you're hired don't murder us i'm not gonna cut my hair short again i could dye the blonde streak in my hair red but i i refuse to cut my hair short again because i had a uh, variance of like a i went like through many stages of bob undercut bowl cut throughout my childhood and i've only just started growing it out and it's got down to my shoulders and i like having long hair honestly oh yeah no uh, i usually just shave my head now because it's easier but speaking of this book and train wrecks, <laughs> yeah. Halloween night. Halloween night. Oh, no. I know. You brought up a good point before we started recording. This book felt like it was stuck in, like, 1989. Yeah, this book feels so 80s because I know Scream came out in the 90s, but I feel like the the whole sort of genre of bunch of kids getting threatened by a murderer was waning a little bit. Because, you know, you had, like, you had, like, your sleepaway camp, your I Know What You Did Last Summer, your Halloween. Slumber Party Massacre. Slumber, yeah, Slumber Party Massacre, uh, Black Christmas. Night Trap. I mean, there are still teen slasher movies being made today, but the, like. But not as cheesy as this. Yeah, the decade where it was, like, the real, like, iconically cheesy teen slasher movies were, like, really part of the zeitgeist was the 80s. And this book feels super 80s yes so meg do you want to describe this awesome cover oh okay this cover is golden um it is it looks like a teen slasher movie from the 80s it does it reminds me um very much of the cover of um i can't even remember the name of the movie but like i can picture this like if i went to blockbuster in like the early 90s and i saw this on a vhs tape oh yeah I would totally pick it up and probably watch it. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you got your it's spooky black background. Um, this cover is very, like, minimalist, and I think that's cool. Uh, spooky black background, a uh, pumpkin growing on a vine with a scary face carved into it. Very, like, monstery face with lots of teeth and frowny eyes. And there is a knife sticking right through a big old kitchen knife. Uh, and then over that, you have this drippy yellow writing that says, Halloween night! And then next to the knife, you have the tagline for the book, which is trick or treat. The trick is not to die. See, and then that, like, reinforces that this should have been, like, a teen slasher movie. Like, that is totally the tagline. Yeah, like, this would have been a much better movie than it was a book. And that's going to be a common theme through this. So, heads up, guys. So, I'll read the back. This party is a killer. Brenda hates her cousin Haley. And Brenda isn't the only one, because Haley keeps stealing other people's boyfriends. So Brenda and her friends decide to plan the perfect murder. Something to go along with Brenda's perfect Halloween party. Not that they're really going to kill anybody, just a joke, right? Ha. 
Ha. I love those two parts. I think I like the Jeff Goldblum laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so this book opens up with girls reading Seventeen and listening to pretty much like Cindy Lauper. And um, the the most dated line in this whole book is probably, "I hate that she took my room because now I don't have anywhere to put up my Luke Perry posters." <laughs> oh my no! I think okay, my favorite outdated line for this is the part where they're listening to the rap music. Oh yeah, there's some, there's some gold nuggets. So our main character in this is called Brenda. Uh, and her evil, stinky, poopy head of a cousin is named Haley. Remember those names, because those are the only two names you'll really remember by the end of this book. Yeah, the other characters in this book are totally interchangeable. Yes, there's uh, Randy, that's uh, Brenda's little brother, Dina, yeah. and I always want to say Monica, Tracy. but it's, tra- it's Chrissy? Tracy with an I. So, yeah, so th- that's our little cast of characters. So, what... What happens, Meg? What happens at the beginning of this book? So we open up with these girls, and they're hanging around in Brenda's room, and Brenda, her cousin Haley, has been kicked out. No, she hasn't been kicked out. Yeah, her parents are getting a divorce, and so she has moved in with her aunt and uncle, um, presumably so the stress doesn't affect her ability to go to school and stuff like that. Except Um, for the stress has done other things to her, but we'll get into that. Oh, yeah. So um, they are... Uh, trying out their Halloween masks, and Brenda will not stop complaining about her cousin Haley and how Haley is a big old bitch, uh, who does real mean things, and... Yeah, like, such as talking bad about their parents, and how, like, mm-hmm. her mom's really ugly, and that Brenda's dad is super fat. And she keeps taking Brenda's clothes, she keeps, uh, borrowing Brenda's car randomly and uh she took brenda's room so she now sleeps in brenda's room and brenda is in i guess the guest room or something i think she's like on the couch pretty much but you haven't even said the worst thing that that Haley has taken from brenda the 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 worst crime on her long list of crimes is Haley takes other people's boyfriends (gasps) oh my god first world 1980s teen problems Oh, any, 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 any teen problems. Because you know what? I knew a girl that was like that. So wait, she would go around like, hey, could you teach me how to drive this car? Wait a second. I already have my license. That was very funny. There's a bit where Haley uh, tells Ted, who is Brenda's boyfriend, Brenda's boyfriend, to teach her how to drive. And so they get in the car, and they're driving, and they go to the car park at the mall, and they're driving around, and um, halfway through the scene, he sees something fall out of her pocket, and he sees it, and it's a full driver's license. And he's like, hey, I th- why do you need me here? And Bre- and well, I keep Haley, Brenda, they're both equally bad. So Haley is like, I just wanted to get you alone, because I've had like a mad crush on you, and I know that you're dating my cousin, but he's based, like she literally just starts making out with him, and he's like, okay. Mm. Oh, Haley's awful, but Brenda's also awful, but everyone's awful. Yeah, so then they go back to the house. Uh, Haley decides to kiss Ted again, and Brenda sees it all. And she looks out the window, and she says, I'm gonna kill Haley for real. For real? For really real. Oh my god. Okay, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, I want to, now I'm curious about, what is the story about the, this person that you knew? She was just, um... She, through um, a mutual friend of ours, would hook up with guys from... Uh, our, our mutual friend used to go to one of the local public schools that was co-ed. And she would basically... She sort of had, like, a checklist of all of the boys that went to that school. And so she would, like, date one of them for a little bit, dump him, move on to the guy at, like, the locker next to him. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she had, like, a list... I I mean, I I have no proof of this, but she must have, because she would always be with a different guy, but they were always from that school. Um, and, uh, one of the, like, one of the things that made me realize that I, I did not want to be friends with her anymore was we went with, we went to a mixer with, uh, with a boys' school, and I was dancing with this guy, and when he went to go get me a drink or something, she swooped in like a hawk. 
with her phone number ready to give to him. And then the next day, this guy texts me to say, I think you and I can just be friends, but thanks for introducing me to Rachel. <laughs> oh, do you want to kill Rachel now? I do want to kill Rachel. I, I looked out the, I saw her a, at school and I looked out the window of the classroom and I said, I'm going to kill her for really real. So how would you kill Rachel? Take inspiration from this book and write write a story for a school assignment. Where the assignment is to make a murder mystery? Yeah, the, the assignment is to make a murder mystery. And so they decide, well, well, let's write a story where we kill Haley. And for some reason, only Dina objects to using actual names in the story. Even though, like, yeah, you would... If you write a story about yourself killing another person in your class and you use your real names... The teacher's not gonna be happy about that. That is a... Yeah, they're pro- the, the cops are probably gonna come to your house and you are definitely gonna be forced to go talk to the school therapist. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's what starts happening. And weird things start to happen. Brenda comes home one day and she goes up to her room and there there's something dripping on her walls and she looks and it's blood. But not just blood. It's a message Meg, what is this message? See you on Halloween. And Brenda's like, I'm going to kill that Haley. Ooh, I'm going to kill it for real. Zach, Zach, we have to, uh, I I would like to interject and make sure to explain to the listeners the reason why Brenda went upstairs. They are cutting, uh, the group of friends and Randy, the little brother, are all cutting pumpkins. Um, This is still... Several days before Halloween, but this is their practice pumpkin, I guess. She's cutting pumpkins, and Haley shows up in a gorilla costume and gives Brenda a real harsh spookening. Oh, no, so, wait, no, so it's, like, legitimately, like, in the chapter, they're cutting, like, these pumpkins and stuff, and then, like, I swear to God, it's, like, and then a gorilla popped out with a knife, and I died laughing just because I thought of the gorilla outfit from Spongebob. Yes, exactly. Brenda is so mad at Haley that she clenches her fist around the knife that she's holding, but somehow she forgets that she's holding it blade side. So she cuts her hand open. And so when she goes upstairs to get a bandage, that's when she finds the writing on the wall. Yes, and I would imagine, like, if you're, like, holding a blade, like, you would need stitches or something, mm. not band-aids. But I guess Brenda is has, like, an X factor. Put some ointment on that and then gauze it up and you're good. No need to go to the hospital or anything. No, she's got to kill that Haley. Ooh, yep. that Haley. Ooh. Zach, I'm just imagining um, Brenda saying Haley in the same way that the dad on Failing on Parents says Dinkleberg. 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 No, I was thinking more like like what Cecil when he says Steve Carlsberg. <gasps> Ooh, oh Steve Carlsberg. Steve Carlsberg. Like the more, I guess maybe the more angry she gets, and that's when she goes to Dinkleberg. Because wait, uh, Haley's last name is Benson. Benson. Because well, clearly the reason why uh, Haley's parents got divorced is you know her dad was a B, her mom was a lawyer. Oh, yeah. uh, do you think she's related to the Welcome to Dead House Bensons? It's a possibility at this point. Do you reckon R.L. Stein knew somebody whose name was Benson, and that's why he keeps going back to that last name? Well, apparently, like, the last couple books we've done, everyone's been named Gabe. <laughs> what happens next is a whole lot of nothing, until Tracy and Brenda decide to go to the old malt shop and listen to ye olde Guns N' Roses music. It feels weirdly anachronistic, that scene, because it's like, they're going to the malt shop. Yeah, it's okay. Which is, like, and it's named it's named Mulligans. That's not the name of a malt shop. That's the name of a sports bar. Well, maybe it got converted into like it was a failed sports bar. And like, I guess we can maybe. make this hip for the teens. Yeah, like it's kind of like Patty's Bar and Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's not really an oh Irish bar. It's just mm-hmm. like an amalgamation of just let's just serve alcohol. Yeah. So these uh, rad teens go down to the malt shop to uh, have some milkshakes and do things. And Brent, um, is- Tracy notices that Haley is there, but not with just anyone. She's not. She's there with her boyfriend Noah. <gasps> the scandal. It's 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 like a crimes against humanity. 
Noah and Tracy get into a big fight in front of everybody. To the point of where she was almost going to throw her malt onto ha- Haley. And Brenda's like, make sure to throw soda. And then Tracy decides to angrily stomp out and throw $5 on the table. And she's like, keep the change. <laughs> that was really funny. I always think it's like, what if this was like like Denny's where you don't pay at the count? You don't pay on your table. You actually have to pay at the counter. Do you have to pay at the counter to at Denny's? I've never been to a Denny's in my life. <gasps> but yeah, you do that at Denny's. You don't pay yeah. at your table. You pay at the, the counter. Denny's is sort of like this mythological entity in... Um, in Australia, because we really only know about it from the Denny's Tumblr. A lot of American fast food chains, there'll be, like, one somewhere. Like, we've got a Sizzler, and... Do you guys have an Outback? We have a singular Outback Steakhouse, and it's really bad. You know what you don't have, Meg? in and out Fun fact, every year there is a uh, bar in Surrey Hills, which does... One day out of the year, they will sell authentic In-N-Out burgers. Like, In-N-Out, the In-N-Out home office gave them permission to use the In-N-Out special recipe to make burgers for one day a year. And every day that year... Does everyone just collect- collectively lose their minds? Australians are obsessed with In-N-Out. Like, I feel like if I had the In-N-Out, like, like the animal style sauce, and then your koala pack, I would, like, die inside. But, like, yeah, D- Denny's and In-N-Out are sort of, like, mythic here. Like, In-N-Out is sort of this mythical godlike burger to us. And then Denny's is this sort of, like, an alternate dimensions restaurant. Sort of like the restaurant at the end of the universe in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, yeah, so people here really... Because Denny's doesn't get mentioned a lot in, like, television or movies. I can think of only the Santa Claus where they go and have... Christmas dinner. At I can only really think of like like the Man of Steel where they crash through an IHOP, but we don't like that movie. So um, yeah, Denny's. Speaking of disasters, uh, yeah. Brenda decides to go home and she smells something stinky in the kitchen. Meg, what stinks so bad in this kitchen? Your mom. No. Ah. Uh. Oh, uh, my my mom tries really hard to cook, but she can't. She can. Her cereal catches on fire. Yeah. So there's a dead bird. In the pumpkin, in what is a is a quite an effective use of word picture painting by Mr. Stein. Like I got really, I don't get nauseated by words, but the way he described it in this, it was I could visualize it and kind of get a little grossed out. Yeah, as much as we pay out on R.L. Stein, uh, two things he does really well: comedic timing and descriptions of gross stuff. Yeah, so, like, in this, he describes that the bird had been decapitated, but you can see, like, it's, like, blood vessels and tendons and... Yeah, like, really sloppily decapitated, not a clean cut. And it's... He also describes the smell, and it just, like, Mm. again... Oh, isn't it? There's also, like, there's blood coming out of, like, the pumpkin's, like, eye holes. Yeah. Like, this was... Okay, this is where I bring up that... This would make a great slasher movie. Like, I'm surprised that, like, Fear Street books weren't turned into slasher movies in the 90s. I mean, honestly, like... Because Fear Street... I was a bit young for Fear Street when they were around, but from what I understand, Fear Street was pretty big with the young adult audience. Yeah, and I'm surprised... I guess maybe it was kind of like Scholastic didn't want them maybe to be like slasher movies. That could have been a factor, but now the... Yeah, maybe they didn't want it to ruin like R.L. Stein's. Like, he, he was sort of like going more towards Goosebumps... The good man Stephen King. Yeah, but now maybe maybe that might be the reason. But then again, now that we're getting three Fear Street movies, I'm interested to see like, are they gonna do it like kind of like Stranger Things, and it's gonna be set like in the early '90s? Because I'd love that. I hope so because they they missed that for Goosebumps. Except no, because he still writes Goosebumps books. I keep forgetting. Yeah, no, it's a very effective scare in this, and I loved every second of it. And it's, then hate. It's one of the only like really like decently written moments in this book because most of it as you have alluded to is just a fat load of nothing yeah because okay so the way i described it i think in the undead express is it's almost like like a verbal drive-by shooting like cool things happen like like there's like these little nuggets of coolness and then it goes away for a while and then the car comes back and to see if the job's done 
Yeah, plot points are introduced out of nowhere and then disappear. Like, there's this one huge plot point of where they're talking, like, Brenda's talking to Dina, and then she has, like, this weird inner monologue. It's like, oh, wait, Dina went through the same thing, too, with a divorce. And let's forget about it. That was very sloppy exposition there. Like, why couldn't Dina have just said, like, oh, you know, being a child of divorce is really hard. I know, because my parents divorced. You know, and not have, like, the the narration be like, ah, yes, Brenda thought about how Dina's parents were divorced also, and how it had been very hard on her. And it's a bit corny. It it baffles the mind a little bit in how that was written. But, again, there's, like, there's great little nuggets, uh, such as the nut, because... We're not, it sounds like we're like skipping ahead, but literally in the space of these books of these events, nothing happens. Like, we can't even make jokes about them because literally nothing happens. So the next, it's great just a big- lot. Of, it's a lot of Brenda saying she's going to kill Haley. It happens so many times. She'll just be like, I'm really going to do it now. Yes. And then the, 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 one of the nails in the coffin is that Haley comes home and yells to Brenda, Help, there's been an accident. Oh, oh, and she's wrecked Brenda's car. Yeah, she's decided to get Brenda's car, and I guess uh, Haley had missed a stop sign, and a car plowed right into her, and she kept saying it wasn't her fault, but that that was one of the, one of the last nails in the coffin. That was the straw that broke the camel's back? No, because um, she decides after that I'm going to go take a walk, and she somehow stumbles across Ted again, and they just decide to get oh, back yeah. together. <laughs> After he's proven time and time again that he's cheated on her. And she was rightfully very angry with him for the rest of the book. There's a point where he calls up and he hears, she hears him on the phone say, hi, Brenda, it's Ted. And immediately she hangs up on him. Yeah, that's fine. And then this happens and they start like making out and it's just like, stop, Brenda, you're too good for this. They're teenagers. They don't know. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to just like, in... In with all of the nothing that happens in between, like, the plot points that we are selectively talking about, there's a lot of, like, the girls sitting around planning uh, increasingly more convoluted ways to kill Haley. Oh, we're gonna get to that. Let's just talk about first the the homecoming. So, Zach, uh, I gotta ask you a question. Uh, Oh, yeah, sure. Something that's been bugging me about this. What in the fresh hell is a homecoming? So... Homecoming is more like the dance or like the initiation of the start of the new school year in high school. I never went to any of mine. The only dance that I went to was my prom, and that was on the Queen Mary, and I spent like 90% of it looking for ghosts. That's so badass. <laughs> I love the Queen Mary, but um, it's like it's a whole lot of nothing because there's like the Sadie Hawkins dance, and then there's winter formal, and then there's prom. Prom is the biggest one. But mm. homecoming, I never went, so. Yeah. My school, we had a few, um, we used to have a fireworks night before it was banned. That's and badass. Then, then we had a few, um, like, m- we would have a few mixers with boys' schools in, like, during the year from, like, 7th grade to ninth grade. And then we had the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade formals, and then the valedictory dinner in 12th grade, but... Because the graduating class of 2010 at my high school uh, were caught doing a lot of bad stuff, a lot of the dances that we were supposed to get got banned for everyone else. Thanks, guys. You ruined it. My school was very big on uh, one person did a bad thing, so everyone gets punished because we want you to hate the person who did the bad thing. (laughs) And they probably already graduated, so it doesn't really matter. Homecoming happens, and Brenda goes to the dance with Ted... And they start dancing to, I don't think, no, this is not when the rap music happens, but they, uh, what do they listen? I think they listen to like the Bengals and um, Michael Jackson. Those are like the two things that are coming to my head right now. So that's what they're listening mm. to. Almost like what happened to you. Like Brenda goes to get a drink and Haley just swoops out of nowhere and just like, hey, Ted, you want to wanna dance with me? And then that's when Noah sees Ted dancing with Haley and he's not going to have none of it because he loved uh, Haley, so they get into a big old fist fight. Like, it, like, it spills out into the parking lot. Proper bashing. And that's when Brenda's like, that's it, guys. We're really, for really reals? Like, really, really reals? Like, super reals. We're gonna murder Haley for real. I know I've said this about a hundred times, but this time, I mean it. <laughs> yes, and then she goes home, 
and she opens up like she goes upstairs and there's a guy poking out looking at her in the window Uh, oh wait no it's a cardboard cutout yeah it just looks creepy and it was a prank she blamed her brother randy did it but the calls are coming from inside the house I gotta say, Randy's got the worst poker face out of any, like, human being in the entire world. Because he didn't even do it, but he's acting so suspicious. No, because all he wants to do is he wants them to play the Prince of Persia with him. And he keeps bringing it up. The Prince of Persia, not Prince of Persia. That's like when people, when, like, old people put the in front of something, like... The Googles? The YouTube. The eBay. How can I get to the Gmails? The internets. They start Googling Google. If you Google Google, it will break the internet. (laughs) So. Uh, Can we just hit pause on this for a little bit? I just want to make sure that everybody knows that there's a dream sequence with a uh, living jack-o'-lantern in it. And it's never mentioned again. Oh, I totally I even forgot about that. So yeah, so Brenda actually goes to sleep during that. No, it is the weirdest thing because it's like... She's being chased by, like, this evil jack-o'-lantern, and she falls, and it starts, like, eating her. And it is the weirdest, like, messed up. It's, like, nightmare fuel. And it's just like, well, that was a bad dream. Moving on. I'm gonna kill that Haley. Ooh, that Haley. Okay, please explain this murder plot, because I don't know in, like, the seven layers of hell. This plot is so confusing. I am going to make an attempt. I cannot promise that this will make sense, but no, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to see how I can debunk this. So, <laughs> so they decide what their costumes are gonna be. So one of them is gonna be a peacock. One of them is gonna be a, a monk. clown. A monk, which is she's literally just gonna wear her dad's old bathrobe. I feel like she's like secretly it's like his old like Obi Wan Kenobi cosplay. <laughs> That's why her parents split because her dad was a freaking nerd. So uh, and then the th- and then the. Th- Someone else is going to be, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Point is, um, Haley's going dressed as a gorilla. Uh, and they're sort of brainstorming ideas and they come up with, like, some stupid ones. Like, one one of them is like, oh, we should give her a poison banana. Too clever. And then everyone else is like, no, that's a dumb idea. Yeah. <laughs> Too simple. So then they decide, oh, we're going to stab her. We're going to stab Haley. We could just shoot her with a gun. No, too dramatic. Let's stab her. A lot. And so then they decide to uh, uh, confuse people about who is doing the murdering. They're all going to switch costumes at some point? Yeah, like, they're going to... No, they're going to they're gonna tell everyone, like, explicitly, Hey, guys, I'm going to dress up as a peacock. Just remember that I'm the peacock. Like, I just imagine that's what they're doing in high school. They just keep saying, like, the same thing over and over again. Guys, I'm going to be dressed as a... You know, I, I'm going to be dressed up as... I'm going to be dressed up as the Princess Leia's. I'm just realizing, I found, like, talking about this now, I've just realized a hole in this plan that I didn't even think about before. What was the hole in this plan? At the very beginning of the book, they established that Dina is taller than the other ones, so if they switch costumes, everyone's going to know which one's Dina. Yeah, well... Okay, there's there's plenty of problems with this plan. The first is that they're going to... so many! The first problem is, is that they're going to use a knife from the kitchen, and that'll be easy to find from the cops. Yeah, from Brenda's own kitchen. The second part of the plan is that, I guess, there's a, there is a laundry chute in the party room, so they were going to, while everyone was distracted, throw the bloody clothes down the laundry chute, and then... And also through the room of, like, what if, like, the slight chance someone's watching her while they murder her with a bunch of... uh, It's, like, the most convoluted thing in existence. Plus, they have the story written pretty much, like, two down to a T. Yeah, that's basically, like, this is on the level of O.J. Simpson making a book called If I Did It, which I didn't. I don't know if that was the actual subtitle, but that's... It's implied. The Halloween party comes around, and uh, at one point it is described as getting... Wait, let me, let me describe it, because I have it written down you properly. Do it, do it. Yeah, you have it written down properly. And when I told this to Meg, I think I broke her. So the Halloween party became hot and steamy. <laughs> oh, they're, also li- they're also listening to the hippity hop, the rap music at this oh, point. The hip hop, hip to the hippie hop, don't stop, something, something. Kangaroo Jack. Is that weird that the first thing that that song makes me think of is Kangaroo Jack? (laughs) There's Kangaroo Jack. (laughs) No, it's fine. 
So yeah, during this uh, hot, sweaty Halloween party with the two Freddy Cougars. With the yeah, with the two Freddy Cougars. Um, because R.L. Stein knows what the kids like. He knows what those teens are into. Like the party's going along, and then somebody notices that uh, the gorilla, uh, the person in the gorilla costume, is sitting on the chair, bleeding to death. And yes. everyone starts to gather and... gather around the, the the monkey because no one wants to like call nine one one or anything. Yeah, I know. It's like and they unmask this monkey. Bum bum bum. Meg, who is the monkey? The old man from the ice cream parlor. Old man no. Jenkins. <laughs> and I would have gotten away with it, too. If it wasn't for you shitty teenagers and your convoluted plan. What's the twist? So, you know, the, the, well, the first twist is that it's Brenda, but then <gasps> double twist. The twist is that Dina was the one that was doing the harassing. Brenda's dead. She's been stabbed once. Uh, she's mm. bleeding profusely. And Haley's there. Actually, this becomes like where it's like Murder on the Orient Express, where yeah, everyone or, starts uh, blaming Haley for everything, and then people yeah. start coming out of, like the woodwork and saying the exact like, "Hey, she stole my boyfriend too, mine yeah. too." Yes, very Agatha Christie sort of moment where it reveals that everyone had a motive. Yes, and but... no one had a motive at the same time. <laughs> yeah, everyone, but also nobody. Um... <laughs> So yeah, so that's when like everyone starts now blaming Haley for it because everyone knew that she was the monkey and the supposed to be the monkey and Brenda was supposed to be the peacock. And then Brenda starts moving. Double twist. Double twist is that she faked her own death because apparently a knife going through foam rubber is, you know, knife proof. Do you know what that reminds me of? That bit in Brooklyn Nine-Nine where Captain Holt is with uh, Rosa and his husband's there and they're talking and Rose is like, Captain, you need to take a break. You've just been stabbed. And Captain Holt's husband is like, what, you've been stabbed? And Captain Holt goes, I've been lightly stabbed. Yeah, because she, uh, she sewed extra padding into the monkey outfit because she really wanted to discover the real killer. And it was Angela the entire time. Oh, wait, no, it was Dina. Wrong movie. Um, yeah, that is some, like, Sherlockian slash Batman-esque levels of forward thinking. Hmm, yes, like she's like she like pulls it like a like an actual like bubble pipe. Yeah. And starts that starts smoking it and starts breaking down. I knew it was you ever since I accidentally She gets out her blue scarf and like hooks it around her neck in that like annoying hipster way. <laughs> it just becomes like a Wes Anderson movie <laughs> all yeah. of a sudden. It's like Dina, I I knew that you were the killer all along because if you work at the animal hospital and you have all this blood and other weird stuff. They would let her just take the blood. Well, this is the 90s, and I'm pretty sure they just threw it down the sink at this point, because Mm. I believe, you know, they keep all that blood now. But they do have blood that is donated for, uh, like, you know, when animals get hit by cars. Uh, They have, or if they get, like, just, like, some kind of horrible thing happens to them, they get donated blood for... At the very least, dogs and horses, because I saw a sign at one of the vets that I went to recently to pick up an animal from that said, um, if your dog is over a certain weight, I uh, forget what weight it was, it may be eligible to be a dog blood donor. So come in here That's and so take cool. some blood. So uh, as if it wouldn't just be like, I think it's weird that they're like, well, obviously Dana did it because she was the only one that could get animal blood because butchers don't exist in this universe. Clearly, and then Dina just admits it, and she's like, I was going to kill you all along because you, for reasons unknown, apparently Brenda, when Dina's parents were getting divorced, didn't help her out whatsoever, but I guess then, like, all of her friends as well? Yeah, I mean, her motive was basically that she uh, was tired of Brenda being so mean to Haley. She didn't want Brenda to be mean to Haley because she related to Haley because they both were from divorced households. And I don't know, I must just be very bad at guessing killers. Either that or the setup was badly written in this book. I thought it was going to be like more like Brenda's fall from grace. Because in this entire book, she is, like, the least likely, like, likable person in this whole, like, I'd rather hang out with Zach from the Undead Express. And that's saying a lot. That is saying, I'd rather hang out with Evan Ross from Monster <gasps> Blood. Oh my god, like, she is, like, the entire book, she's just horrible, and she's just plotting to murder everyone. Haley is just as bad. I don't there's no middle ground. They're all bad, really. 
No, they're all horrible people. But um, this book throws you a couple curveballs because at the beginning, like when they set up, oh, we're going to write a story where we murder Haley. And also from the back of the book, the description from the back of the book kind of gives this impression too, that this book is going to be a story where um, they write a story about killing Haley or they like do a prank uh, and they end up taking it too far, and then they actually kill Haley. End up introducing all of this stuff about, like, uh, Brenda getting harassed, the bird, and the blood on the walls and stuff. The maggots. Oh, yeah, we forgot. She finds, like, rotten meat in her bed. Oh, yeah, yeah, and there's, like, maggots and stuff. That's so gross. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real nasty. It's real nasty. I mean, like, my dog has left uncooked chicken wings in my bed before. That's still not as gross as, like, properly rotting meat. Once it sort of, like, was revealed that there's somebody targeting Brenda, I thought that... I don't know why I thought it was going to be Tracy. I, I'm just realizing that I, I've had Brenda and Haley confused this entire time. For me, I always thought it was going to be either be Dina or actually Haley. It would have made sense, but I feel like they kind of thought, oh, that would make too much sense if it was Haley, because then you'd be able to figure that out in 10 seconds. we got to have a well, twist Well, no, because it's kind of like, it's the twist of them switching places, and everyone, like, maybe it was like Haley was just a, like a devil spawn child, and that's why their parents are getting a divorce type of thing. Like, she's just pure, like, Damien evil. Yeah, if my child was Haley, I would... I would not be happy. <laughs> no. So this book ends with Dina trying to get away. And some for some reason, someone finally called the police. And the police come and physically, like, tackle her, like, linebacker style. Which is very, like, it made me uncomfortable. Because she's, like, she's like a, a 17 or 18-year-old girl described as being, like, skinny in build. Yeah, and she's getting tackled to the ground by a couple of grown ass men. And then they they haul her away to like a like an asylum basically. Which and then Brenda and Haley become best friends and drink cocoa. So she's she gets committed because she just gets instantly committed. There's no like you're gonna go to jail and then you're gonna get a psychiatric evaluation, which is I'm pretty sure what happens in real life. I'm pretty sure that's what happens in real life too, but this is not that real life. So, yeah, so, but then they end up Haley and Brenda because I guess attempted murder brings people closer together. They end up sharing a hot cocoa together because it's like, you know, uh, Haley, you know, somehow doesn't care that Brenda was like, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill you 500 times, and Brenda no longer cares that Haley crashed a car and stole her man. And they all lived happily ever after. Yeah. Or did they? Dun, dun. Bum, bum, yes, they bum. did, because this is a standalone. There's book. a Halloween night, too. Is. Oh! I don't have it, but it exists. I, I don't know if I want to read it. I don't want to either. Maybe maybe later on, maybe on Halloween. Howdy, folks. This is the part of the show where we pick the next book for next week, and we've decided to go against the grain and try something completely different. We're going to start reading modern day Goosebumps book series. So the first book we're going to be reading in this is the Goosebumps Horrorland series. And this is like the like R.L. Stein literary universe because they're all connected. So the first book we'll be reading is Revenge of the Living Dummy. So check it out. So do we have any like shout outs and listener mail this week? Oh, yes. Actually, we have a lot. So the one that made me like my brain break was that. We got followed by one of my favorite true crime podcasts, Wine and Crime, and I died a little inside. Shout out to Wine and Crime. <laughs> they are like the best ladies. They talk about true crime and drink a shit ton of wine. Yes. And they all have like the best like Minnesotan accents. Like almost word for word, we just did the opening of an episode of Wine and Crime. Like all the things that we mentioned were things that they say in the interview. A uh, special shout out to One Little Spark podcast. They're an awesome like Disney World podcast. Uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, it's really cool. I got a chance to talk to you, and we're going to be doing stuff. We have things in the works. And then we need to also thank the Film Roast podcast, because they sat down and talked to me about just podcasting stuff in general, and they're really cool. Like, they talk, almost like wine and crime, they talk about movies and drink coffee. Yeah, it's sort of the opposite of wine and crime when you think about it. They consume a drink that contains a stimulant while talking about fictional things. Meg, you know what we should do? We should just start drinking, like, Ecto Cooler and talk about Goosebumps books. I really want us to do a Goosebumps drinking game sometime, like, maybe as a Patreon special. <laughs> oh my god, we'll die. 
Uh, we w- will we'll have to uh, drink. We will, as you say, have to drink Echo Cooler because if we drank real alcohol, we'd bo- both be headed to the hospital real quick. Another weird thing that happened this week was um, when we recorded with B. So shout out to B. Mm-hmm. Uh, the exact hour, an article was released that talked about how R.L. Stein hated this year's Unfortunate Events movie. And it blew my brain because it came out the same hour as we decided to record our episode. He knows. And then we did get a listener question, Meg. We did. So from Amateur 13, of all the Goosebumps, which are your favorites to read? Now, I think we're going to go top like three with this because it's way easier than picking a single favorite out of 65 goddamn books. Um, there's, there's more than that, but I guess top three because um, they change. For me, they always change. Yeah, well, uh... What's your number? What's your top three? The two that I've consistently loved since I was a kid have been Vampire Breath and Be Careful What You Wish For. Because I think the writing on those is just, like, just fantastic writing. Like, way, like, that is R.L. Stein bringing his A-game. And, um, the stories are really, really interesting. Really cool. Uh, and then my third favorite has to be one that I went back and I read a couple years ago before we started this podcast uh, called The Horror of Camp Jelly Jam. Yes. And it's a little goofy. It's a little bit goofy because of all of the sports references. Um, Go sports. Football. Football. Send your kids to Camp Jelly Jam. They're going to do sports. Ah, sports. Ah, science. Ah, energy. Ah. Um, yeah, but it's a little cheesy sometimes, but... It's got a really cool monster and a really fun premise and some actually, honestly, quite effective imagery. I haven't read that one in years, so I'm excited to read that one again. Yeah, oh, I'm so excited to get to that one when we get to that one, because it's amazing. I love it. Well, actually, I'm first, the the first one in the list out of that one. Be like, careful what you wish for. Was, yeah, we're going to get to that one soon, and I'm so stoked. So, uh, what are your top three? So my number one is always going to be the Cuckoo Clock of Doom, just because the idea of de-aging and you were aware of it is a horrifying thing. Also, I really like the character in that, and that's just a really scary premise. Uh, my number two would actually have to be Calling All Creeps, because that's also another scary premise, because it's like you're getting weird phone calls in the middle of the night, and they're also lizard people that are trying it's- to take over the government. I love the ending of that book. That book's amazing. And then, for me, for number three, it's really hard to pick. It's either between Night and Terror Tower or The Blob That Ate Everyone. But because The Blob That Ate Everyone, the guy's name is Zack, go narcissism, mm. I think it might have to win out. But also, that has, like, the weirdest ending in exi- like. Oh, man. I, I think about it constantly. Me too. I mean, I can remember being in my school library reading that book. Like, I was just there after school waiting for my mom to pick me up or something, and I was reading that book. And when I got to the ending, I physically threw the book at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, this is this book has gotten too meta for me. Yeah. T- t- Christopher too- Nolan, leave me alone. Too deep, too deep. Yeah, so Thank you, Amateur13, for submitting a question. We always love when people send us listener questions. We do. We did get an awesome iTunes review this week. So, from Darkest Leper. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reading the username, not... The words are just coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Very funny, very nostalgic. I listened to the Snakebite Canyon episode, and it was so fun. If you need an entertaining listen for when you work or go to the gym or whatever else, look no further. Goosebumps fans and newbies alike are sure to get a kick out of this. Aw, thank you so much. Thank you. That, we, that means a lot to us when we get, like, iTunes reviews, because, you know, yes. it's very simple to send an iTunes review, but for us, that, it means that we're doing our jobs kind of correctly. And it and it sort of helps get the word out about the show, too, because, you know, if you rate and review, it sort of pushes you up on the iTunes It, it bumps us up a little yeah. bit. So if you guys haven't sent us, like, an iTunes review, I will totally read them on the show. And yes. me and Meg will read them, like, constantly. We'll just have, like, we'll get to the time we'll have, like, a collage of them. Oh, and... definitely. Oh, definitely. Uh, any shout-outs you want to give, Meg? PSA for all of our Australian listeners, if you're not registered to vote in the Postal Marriage plebiscite, what are you doing? Go out there and register. Be a citizen of your country. Because we need to bully the politicians into actually doing things and not just sitting around and arguing about who 
has passports from what countries? <laughs> That's a real that's a real scandal that's going on in Australian politics right now, like finding out that people have yeah, people that have dual citizenships. Anyway, yeah. So Meg, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Meg Tudin. That's at M E G T U T E N. I am also on Tumblr, soda soda banana dot tumblr dot com. You can also find my other podcast, which is called the Trivial Terror Podcast. Look for that on iTunes and Podbean. So if you want to follow our show, that's at Night Fear Street. If you want to follow me personally, that's at Suda41. If you want to email our show and send us Spooky Dukes messages, that's Nightmare and Fear Street at gmail.com. If you want to help us reverse engineer alien technology to give to our men in black, you can donate to our Patreon. That's Nightmare and Fear Street slash Patreon.com. I'm Zach. I'm Meg. And stay, stay spooky. spooky. Bye.